Hi everyone, it's Amy here from the blog I Think Therefore I Teach. Welcome to your next Religious Studies instalment. This one is for the second year DCT topic of Pluralism and Theology. Right, let's get going. Religious Pluralism and Theology then. The first thing I get my students to do is I get them to discuss that question at the top. Is Christianity the only true religion? It's a core question that runs throughout this whole topic. And it was a question that John Hick actually asked during a theological society in Norwich. And so what I get my students to do is I get them to discuss what their answer would be to that. Is Christianity the only true religion? What are their views for and against this? I then get them to discuss and think about, do you think Christians should learn from being part of an interfaith dialogue? An interfaith dialogue being a dialogue with people of different faiths. What's the strengths and drawbacks of that? And then finally, should Christians convert others to Christianity? Is conversion important, necessary, needed? After we received, sorry, my oh, postman. After we've discussed their answers, I also get them to pick out the words within that question. The word me really that stands out in that question is the, or is the word true. What does true actually mean? And so you can question that in an exam. You can question that in an essay if a question like that does come up is, what does it mean by true? Who's making the distinction of the word true? So always pick out words in the question as well and discuss them. Writer Alan Race in Christians and Pluralism 1982 identifies three broad perspectives of Christians uh, where how they might approach dealing with people of other faiths. You have exclusivism, no salvation other than Christianity. Christianity is the only way. Inclusivism, which is Christianity is key, but it is possible for non-Christians to be saved by Christ. Pluralism, the more the merrier many many paths to salvation so alan race is best just for those definitions that's about the only place that alan race pops into this so exclusivism what is it the christian exclusivist position claims that other religions cannot lead people to the right relationship with god Jesus Christ brought salvation to the world, but only then hearing the gospel and responding with faith in Christ can you then be saved. This includes the rite of baptism, being cleansed of sin and reborn as a Christian. Salvation requires giving up your old way of life and there is no other path available to salvation. couple of pointers that you might want to think about and consider when you're writing your essays is how that second to last point there about salvation requires giving up your old way of life. You could do a synoptic link there to Bonhoeffer. That's very Bonhoeffer-esque in his approach, this idea of giving up your old way of life. It could imply that Bonhoeffer was therefore an exclusivist, but that's a judgment you can pass. And the idea of when you see the word sin, being cleansed of sin, that's very Augustian. This idea that we are born with sin, the original sin from Adam and Eve. So again, you've got a nice little synoptic link that you could make there. Now, some people prefer to call this view particularist, finding exclusivist to threatening and arrogant in this approach and instead particularist is less negative in tone than exclusivist which might appear hostile arrogant or lack of respect my question though is this is it the name of them that's the problem or the approach they take that's the problem and so i question whether they're just sugarcoating over an approach that actually it's not the name exclusivist that appears hostile arrogant or lacks respect but actually the claims behind their position, the idea that Christ is the only true way and that you have to give up your own life and be cleansed of sin in order to reach salvation. My students and I then watched Dr. Andy Bannister. I highly recommend this video. It's, it's about three minutes long, if that, and he raises three very, very good arguments and points as to why 
Christianity could be considered the only true religion. He looks at the idea of what the idea of true means and questions that it's not Christian arrogance, but either they are just right or they're wrong. And so it's not a matter of whether they are arrogant, it's just a matter of whether they are correct in their claims. So do check out Dr. Andy Bannister and you can mention him in an essay. If exclusivism wasn't bad enough, you have a narrow exclusivist approach. This means that only Christians within their own denomination are saved. So, for example, Christians that take the Bible literally or propositionally, I prefer the word propositional than Bible-believing Christians, whilst others read it more for guidance or even myth. Uh, the reason I don't really like the phrase Bible-believing Christians, you can use this though it is within the exam board textbook, is because are all Christians Bible-believing in some to some extent? Um, so I prefer the word propositional, which again means a literal interpretation. Augustine, 4th century, and Calvin, 16th century, were both narrow exclusivists. What a surprise! Believing that through God's grace, only a select few Christians will be elected to heaven. So just being a Christian is not enough. So God's grace, as we've known from previous topics, like again Bonhoeffer, God's grace is the love and mercy God shines upon you. You can't ask for it, you just hope he picks you. Catholic theologian de Costa calls this restrictive access exclusivist. A bit like getting to a nightclub and unless you have the VIP pass, you are not getting in. It's restrictive access heaven. Only God's grace and certain denominations will be saved. Exclusivist in general then, you can have Hendrik Kramer. He was a leading figure in the Netherlands to bring different Christian denominations together and this was part of the ecumenical movement. His book, The Christian Message in a Non-Christian World, 1938, was very influential for Christian missionaries working in non-Christian countries. Now I find, as I said to my students, I find that book title very interesting. 1938, you would expect a book about being a Christian, not about a Christian and non-Christian world. You'd expect society to be, to be heavily Christian at that point. But don't forget 1938, we are commencing into the Second World War. Um, so it's the ideas there that we've already had the First World War, we're into the Second World War, people are losing their faith. And so for Hendrik Kramer, it's about how to deal with that. And so it was the Christian's mission to go out and preach the word of Christ. This book emphasised that non-Christians cannot achieve salvation through their own faith systems, but must convert to Christianity. And so I get my students to research into Christian missionary work. I get them to find examples of where they've gone to other countries and maybe the problems that they've encountered when dealing with Aboriginal um, territories, etc. And then whether it is ethical to really enforce your views on others by saying that unless you convert to Christianity, you are not going to be saved. Is that ethical? Cal Barth was a Protestant theologian who could be seen as an exclusivist. He never actually described himself in this way, but then what he argues could definitely be seen as exclusivist. Um, he's the guy from death and afterlife in the first year that talks about limited election and the idea that everybody can be saved but only that those that follow Christ. So you'll see patterns as you come across Karl Barth that really do um, emphasise and sound quite exclusivist in nature. Barth believes that people cannot know God through their own effort but that God chooses to reveal himself through Jesus, the living word, the Bible, the witness to this revelation and the church in spreading this gospel to everyone. God can only be known through Christ and cannot be found through human efforts, however sincere people might be. So what that means is, however a good a person you are, whatever good things that you do, unless you know Christ, unless you follow and have faith in Christ, doesn't matter how sincere you are in your approach, you still will not be saved. So the question that you're all asking then is where do I sign up for this exclusivist approach? The first tip then, do not be led by political correctness or a fear of offending others on matters of ultimate truth. You must go forth and be brave. Do not be worried about political correctness. Do not be worried about fearing of offending others who might be obviously of different faiths. No, 
you have the truth you are the truth you must proclaim that truth why because the christian message is not a matter of personal taste but is a vital importance for everyone's eternal soul this means it's necessary to make it plain to non-christians that they are just wrong all those not a christian on a christian path are in danger of damnation love that word it's so much better than hell damnation Missionary work and trying to convert others to Christianity is a duty. It's not a sign of ignorance. So if you have someone in front of you that's a Muslim, it's not a sign of ignorance towards their faith. They're just wrong. And it's your place to tell them they are wrong because you believe that the only way their eternal souls are saved is by following Christ and Christianity. I get my students and think about which family this sounds very much like. And the family, of course, is the Westboro Baptist Church in America, America's most hated family. Check it out if you haven't already. And then I get them to consider and think about, is this the true Christian message? Is this right? Is this the Christian message? Moving forward then. The Catholic Church was often associated with the motto extra ecclesium nulla salus. This is the idea that there is no salvation outside the church. You have to be part of the church in order to be saved. That was the Catholic message until the Vatican II. Now, the Vatican II is something that you have to know about. This was the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council, where what they did over a number of years was went through all the documents and updated them. So... You can't really argue that Christianity is outdated because it is kind of outdated. It was written 2,000 years ago, so of course it's outdated. But you also have to recognise that in the 60s, which is when this took place, they modernised and updated documents. So yes, it's still 50 years old, give or take, but it's still not quite 2,000 years without it being developed and adapted. So after a long series of meetings, that's a lot of meetings. Between 1962 and 65, um, where leading figures discussed the Catholic Church into the modern world, the result was a more positive and open response to other denominations and other world faiths. We'll come across different documents of, um, from the Vatican II as you go through your six um, upper six DCT topics. So you will come across these more and more. Finally, before we move then into inclusivism, we look at broad exclusivism. This is just the view that holds that all people who accept Christ will, through their faith, be saved, regardless of whatever denomination you are. And this, again, is what Catholic uh, theologian de Costa calls universal access, open to everyone as long as you're a Christian. And this recognises that Christ's salvation is open to all, even post-death within purgatory. Please be clear, de Costa is only stating the names of different approaches. He is not supporting exclusivism. And then the quote there in the box to the side, God our Saviour desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth in 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 4. That's a really nice quote is that one. And obviously, if it was only half the quote, God our Saviour desires everyone to be saved, that's more of a pluralist idea, that it wants everyone to be saved. But it's that other extra bit there, and to come to the knowledge of the truth, the knowledge of the truth meaning Christ. You have to come to the knowledge of Christ in order for God's love to, or God's grace to shine upon you. Inclusivism then. Inclusivism is the middle ground between the two arguments. Carl Rayner is our inclusivist. You might remember Carl Rayner from previous earlier topics, including um, Person of Jesus, one of my favourite topics, um, where Carl Rayner describes Jesus like an onion. I love that. That Jesus' human nature is on the outside and the inner layers of the onion are the divine parts of Jesus. So it's the same guy, Carl Rayner, the onion guy. He is our inclusivist. Rainer, a Catholic theologian, was extremely influential and one of the leading voices in the Vatican too. He says that Christianity is unique, founded on God's ultimate act of revelation through Jesus, and it is the absolute religion. It sets the standard for all other religions to be measured by. However, one thing he did notice was that that approach, that exclusivist approach that Christianity is unique and sets the bar for all of the faiths through Christ, 
seems to exclude certain groups of people. Most obviously, those that lived before Christ. What that means is, does that mean Adam and Eve aren't in heaven? Moses, Abraham, Job, all these key figures within the Bible, these key influential people are not in heaven because they never knew Christ. And what about people that have just never heard about Christ for no fault of their own? People that live in areas of the world that have just never heard the name Christ, God or Christianity before. Should they be punished? Do they get to the pearly white gates and go, wow, where am I? Oh, sorry, you've never heard of us. You've got to go away. No, why would an all-loving God do that when it's not their fault? And so that's what Rayner recognised. He said that this does not seem, the exclusivism does not seem in line with God's omnibenevolent nature, his all-loving nature, because it excludes people that live before and people that have never heard of Christ, which seems completely unfair. What you've also got to question with an exclusivist approach is that Jesus himself was a Jew. Jesus, yes, he preached his message, but Jesus never went to a church. They were built afterwards. He never proclaimed himself a Christian because Christian Christianity was created because of Jesus. He wasn't actually a Christian. He was a Jew. So does that mean Jesus is half in heaven and half not? Where would Jesus be if it was exclusivism? Therefore, what Rena did was he rejected the idea of exclusivism and some people through, as some people through no fault of their own never hear the words of Christ and therefore, according to an exclusivist, would never receive salvation. He did not agree with that whatsoever, so he believes that everybody should have the opportunity if, if that is the case for them. However, this is the big caveat. If you do hear about Christ, then you must follow Christ. You have no excuse then. So, for example, you, me, students, people out there, anybody that hears about Christianity, we live in a Church of England country, for example, you have no excuse. <coughs> Sorry, it's throat, but I've cut it out so you didn't have to um, subject yourself to listening to me coughing. So, what Rayner is saying there is that you have no excuse. If you have heard the message of Christ, the name of Christ or anything about Christianity, you must then follow it. You have to become a Christian in order to be saved because there is no excuse for your ignorance. Rainer then presents his argument known as the anonymous Christian. The Lumen Gentium is a key document uh, and was one of the pinnacle and principal achievements of the Vatican II and it's known as the Lumen Gentium or the Light to the Nations. And this quote is a quote taken from it. It said that through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and are loved by grace try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience. These two may achieve eternal salvation. So what I get my students to do is I get them to pick out a small part of that quote that they could remember because you're never going to remember all of that and in your exam you only have 40 minutes so spending your time one memorising that and two writing it all down is a waste of time. Instead I would pick out some parts like sincere heart, dictates of conscience, gospel of Christ, um, eternal salvation, something like that. So pick out a small quote or a few small phrases from it and then put the rest into your own words. What is it saying? What is it implying? However, Kramer, our exclusivist, jumps in here and argues against this perspective. He argued that any other religion is misguided. It's a misguided attempt to at the truth which are cultural constructs, not responses to revelation. So what he's saying is other religions are misguided. They're just cultural constructs. They are taking you away from the true meaning and message. However, Rayner disagrees with this, and he argues that non-Christian religions can hold some truth. So, for example, Abraham, Moses and Job never experienced the teachings of Jesus yet they were aware of the grace of God. At the end of the day, God spoke to Moses, burning bush and all of that. You know, Moses, go to Egypt and save the Israelites. So he had a relationship with God. He recognised the grace of God, yet wasn't then able to go to heaven because he'd never experienced Jesus. Doesn't really work. 
And so instead, Rayner calls these people anonymous Christians, as in they are Christian, they just don't know it. They do not call themselves Christians. They have not been baptised, they don't go to church, they don't read the Bible. But in the decisions they make and the attitudes they adopt are turning to Christ without knowing it. Um, just before I move on, what I say to my class is that this is what will help you achieve the structure of this will help you achieve those top end grades you've got an original text with a quote putting the quote in your own words you've got a criticism of that you've got a defense argument from that with a key uh, phrase and key word anonymous christian however what is missing from that is your evaluation you have to then say which argument works better which viewpoint what's the good things or bad things about Kramer and vice versa to what extent do these points work or not work so that's what's missing from that slide and then you would get a very very good mark for that von balthazar finishes this off von balthazar was actually a colleague of Rayner, but a fierce critic of his idea of anonymous christian he argued the church should not go into hiding in the modern secular world or present a watered down version of the christian message in order to appease people of other faiths or of no faith. Instead, you should be able to stand out in the open and be courageous in your claims that salvation is to be found only in Christianity. So he did not agree or like Rayner's perspective. He did not agree with the anonymous Christian. He said that you shouldn't water it down or try and appease people. Not really sure the anonymous Christian is trying to appease people. It's just saying... If you haven't heard of Christ or was born before Christ, then you can still get into heaven. It's not really watering it down. It's saying if you, you know, at the end of the day, Rainer still says if you hear about Christ, you then have to follow him. But another argument is there and you can engage with this either in support or against, of course. Finally, pluralism. This is the view there are many different religious traditions that can all have value and lead others to other followers to salvation. Generally, it's argued that different religions share the same ultimate goal. The beliefs and practices associated with different religions arise because of human culture and the differences are only superficial. So it's the idea that differences arise because of the different religions, but and this is because of human culture. So our culture is different from the culture in India, from the culture in Pakistan, from the culture in Jerusalem. We have different cultures, but these differences that arise in through the religions that we have are just superficial. The core, the cause, the core values in all religions can be seen as very similar, like the idea of the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. That's a common theme in a lot of world religions. And so actually the superficial differences are just because of the human culture, but the core about the religions are often very similar. What I get my students to do then, and I really enjoy this activity, is I get them to draw this as for a bit of fun. Um, but this is an analogy or a story you can use in an essay, and it's the idea of the elephant and the blind men. And so you have one blind man at the front on the trunk that says an elephant is like a big snake. Someone on the foot says, actually, no, it's a tree stump. You have someone with the ear saying, what are you saying? It's like a sheath of leather. And then actually, and then the one at the end says, actually, you're all wrong. It's like a furry little mouse. And so this is the idea that they are all arguing that each other is wrong. They are all saying that they know the answer and that each of them um, is not, you know, each of the other people is not correct because it's like a tree stump or a snake or a furry mouse. And this is a really good analogy to show pluralism. Um, it's it rep it recognizes that actually all what is missing is a recognition that of the bigger picture. So this is the idea that each of them men represents a religion that's saying I'm the right way. I know what it is. I think God is like this: Yahweh, Allah, Brahman, whatever it is, and we are right. And what this argument is showing is actually you're all right. You're just missing the big picture of what you're talking about. So you've just got different cultural representations based on where you live, but you're all actually looking at the same big picture. So it's a really nice analogy or story that you could use in an essay. John Hick's pluralism continued then. John Hick actually started out as an evangelical Christian. He was firmly convinced in the truth of Christianity and to the extreme on the extent of needing to convert others to that salvation. 
um, uh, convert others to Christianity and Christ to reach salvation. However, Whilst he was working in Birmingham at the university, he was so impressed by the faith and service of his fellow Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims. He noticed their commitment to prayer, to family values, to willingness to work together to help disadvantaged people and their genuine commitment to living godly lives. So it really bugged him and bothered him of why would the God of love, his God of love, the omnibenevolent God, really deny such people salvation just because they call themselves a Sikh, a Hindu or a Muslim when actually the core values that they hold, commitments to prayer and family um, and disadvantaged people, charity work, is all the same. And so what Hick argued is he said that we need a Copernican revolution. Now I love this argument, I think it's a really good argument. Basically Copernicus was uh, a man that lived many many years ago and before Copernicus it was believed that the earth was the centre of the universe um, sorry my cat's just been uh, annoying um, Copernicus argued that the um, that before Copernicus sorry that the earth was the centre of the universe and everything rotated and revolved around the earth but what Copernicus recognised and said was hang on a minute no it doesn't the earth is just one of many rotating around the sun. And so Copernicus was the one that recognised in the ideas of the solar system and that the earth was not the centre of the universe and centre of everything, that actually the earth was just one of many rotating around the sun. So Copernicus caused a huge shift in the way scientists of the day understood the universe by proposing the earth was not the centre, but one of many planets orbiting the sun. So then what I get my students to do is I get them to work out how this represents religion. How does this represent religion, Christianity and God? And I get them to draw a little diagram to try and help them explain it. So, of course, what John Hick is arguing here is that Christianity is not the centre of the universe. Everything doesn't revolve around Christianity. In fact, Christianity is just one of many planets or one of many religions uh, all revolving around the sun or God. So we're just one of many different ways of revolving around the same idea which is God and that none of them is any more correct than the other because we are all focused on the same idea or the same core which is God. I think it's quite clever. Hick continued, I'm nearly there. Hick drew upon Kant's ideas when formulating his plur pluralistic theology. Kant drew a distinction between the nominal and the phenomenal world. The nominal or the noumenal world is the world as things really are. Kant thought the nature of God belonged in the nominal world. We are not capable of knowing God as, as he really is because our minds are finite, as in they are dissolvable they're not infinite they will end they're finite they're not perfect and so in this sense we are not capable of understanding god god exists on a different plane in the nominal world or the noumenal world and so therefore we can't fully understand god instead we exist in the phenomenal world as the world appears to us as humans with our finite minds and understanding and so Hick argues that religion is a human phenomenal attempt to understand god all religions are human constructs where we filter our understanding of God in accordance with our own context and cultural upbringing. Every religion falls short of the truth because no one is capable of nominal understanding of God. Now, I really like those arguments from Kant. I think he really has got something there in what he's saying because religion at the end of the day is a human construct. It is culturally based. It is our way of trying to understand God. This does not mean God does not exist. Uh, this just means that all we have is our ability to try and work God out. So you could use this argument against tons of different people like Feuerbach and Freud who said that religion because of this is, is a human construct and therefore is an illusion. What you can argue is just because it is a human construct is the way that we create religion to understand God. It doesn't affect God's existence. A bit like the ontological argument. Just because you don't understand God fully doesn't affect God's existence because God exists in a different world to us. And so this would explain why there's different religions, different interpretations and 
mistakes amongst the religions, they all fall short of the truth. For Hick, Christianity should not be understood as the truth because there's too many flaws, just like all other religions. And again, I think he has something there because we can easily point out the flaws in Christianity, the contradictions in the text, the fact that there's so many errors in the writing and the translations. There are too many flaws for it to be the truth because of the human involvement in it. And so John Hick even goes as far to say that the views that Jesus is incarnate, as in the body of Christ, and the body of God, sorry, God made flesh, rose back from the dead, or born a virgin, are myths. Claims made by different religions are just different symbols, each meaning in their own context rather than contradictory. Each meaningful, sorry, in their own context rather than contradictory. So John Hick is really going out on a limb here and is quite controversial in those views because they are the core teachings of Christianity, the incarnation, the rose back from the dead and the born a virgin. And he's saying they are myths. They are just our interpretations of God and of Christ. And so therefore it's our cultural understandings. But this doesn't mean they're meaningless. This just means that they are one view that should be accepted with lots of other views as well as symbols meaningful within their own context. Finally, we have Raymond Panikka. Raymond Panikka comes from it from a completely different angle and different perspective. He had a different pluralist view. He believed in openness rather than making any claims to know what the truth is or where it might be found. He came from a mixed family. Father was Indian Hindu and his mother was Spanish Catholic. And he said this quote to the New York Times, I left Europe as a Christian. I discovered I was a Hindu and I returned a Buddhist without ever ceasing to be a Christian. What do you think about that? Do you think that's possible? Can you be all of those religions at the same time? Can you have, is it just faith or belief or understanding or is it talking about the core values he lives by? Is it possible to be what he's arguing, to remain Christian but still then clash yourself as a Hindu and a Buddhist. That will give you a good bit of evaluation for your essay. Panikka emphasised the mystery of the divine God without destroying different cultural traditions and diversity. Not sure someone's faith should be known as a cultural tradition. Maybe they should be separate. That Religions do give you cultural traditions but not sure... Don't know if that's what he's, the way is going down there, uh, the path is going down there. Um, Panikkar is also known for saying that he tried to find his religious identity by losing it. This was all starting to me at the time to sound a bit like religious fluidity. The idea that one day he might be Christian, then he might be Buddhist, or he might be both, and then another day he'll be Hindu. Is it possible to find your identity by losing it? Is it possible to be all these religions at once? Again, it's up to you and your essays to decide what you think and how you wish to argue it. Uh, I get my students to do a cut and stick after that with the different arguments. And then these are some questions that you might wish to have a go at. And all loving God would not deny anyone the chance of salvation. All good people should be saved regardless of which faith they follow. And there is no other means of salvation but through Christ. So you might wish to give one of them a practice um, or part of practice if you would like. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching everybody. I hope you found this useful. Please drop any comments or questions below that I can help you with and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss out on future videos. Thanks very much everyone. Bye for now.